Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin, and I have again with me Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and the OpenMPI Project. Jeff? Hey, Brock. Hey, you know, it was uh, it was just pointed out to me. I'm, I'm embarrassed that I didn't realize this myself, but it was just pointed out to me that we're, uh, we're effectively at a year anniversary here. Do you realize we've been doing RCE for about a year? Yeah, this will be the twenty uh, fourth episode. We've missed a couple in there for holidays and stuff, but no, it's it's been a good time, and I'm kind of surprised uh, it's still going. It was just a an idea, and it's been a good time. Yeah, it seems to be a good one. We've talked to a lot of interesting people, a lot of interesting projects out there, and I think our stats are up to on the order of you know two hundred downloads an episode or something like that. So you know, pretty good for two guys just talking to a bunch of random people and whatnot. No, no media backing, no uh, advertising budget, no nothing. Just uh, two guys in Skype. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and thanks so much for uh, volunteering to be my uh, co-host and gone through all these shows with me and meeting up every week and. The yeah, care no problem. Of. This, is, this is a this is interesting stuff. You get to talk to a lot of fascinating people who are doing similar yet different kinds of things. Stuff that overlaps with my work and stuff that doesn't overlap with my work. So it's a it's a great opportunity to learn uh, new things, which is kind of what I assume that uh, our listeners are here for too. Okay, so it's all good stuff. So happy anniversary, Brock. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeff. <laughs> Let's get on to today's show. Yeah, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we have today the Petsy Project. Uh, we have uh, Matt Neeply and Jed Brown. Um, I didn't get exactly where they're both located at, but they'll probably be able to introduce themselves. Uh, Jed, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, so um, I'm at ETH Zurich right now. Um, and I've been using Petsy since about 2004 uh, when I was at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Cool. Uh, I'm Matt, and um, right now I'm at the University of Chicago Computation Institute, and I started using Petsy during my PhD in 1997. And I was at Argonne for s- seven years um, as, you know, developing that full time. Okay, so... Are one of you working on Petsy currently, and one of you is just a user? Are you both working on it? Are you both users? Yeah, so I've been contributing to Petsy a fair amount for the last like year or so, and I put some new features in, but I'm not an official developer. Oh, I think I think you're official now. I think your picture's <laughs> on the page. But uh, yeah, and I, I'm an official developer. I'm one of the, the guys that maintains it. Okay, and this is out of the uh, the MCS division at Argon is the official host of Petsy, right? Okay, so MCS how about being mathematical and computer sciences? Just for those who aren't aware of the acronym, there. Hmm. I did get that right, didn't I? I hope so. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Mathematics and computer science. So how about you give us a rundown on what Petsy is? I'm a sysadmin. I've installed it a number of times, and I have a number of people who use it, but I've never actually used it. So what are some of the features, and what does it do? Uh, well, uh, it's first and foremost a set of libraries, and it's a set of libraries intended to solve nonlinear algebraic equations, and its focus is on large distributed memory, memory parallelism, and that pretty much necessitates iterative solvers. So that's been the focus. And it, you know, lots of people. It's it's uh, targeted primarily for PDEs, but people use it to solve ODEs and variational problems and other things like that. Okay, when I uh, built uh, Petsy, I noticed it comes with a lot of optional packages, and you guys have actually built your own build system around it. Um, what kind of features do these optional packages you add on? I noticed another guest we had on the show before was the HDF5 project. You can use HDF5. What mm. kinds of things can you enable and disable inside Petsy? So most of the optional packages in Petsy are uh, third-party solvers of some sort. And yeah, essentially every Petsy object has a plug-in architecture. And so what you're doing when you enable these external packages is you're activating those plugins. And then the user at runtime can choose whether to uh, to use those third-party libraries in part of their solution process or to skip them. So as a little uh, add-on to that, what is the uh, history of Petsy? You should probably back up a little bit. Where did it come from and when did it get started? 
so Petsy is uh, was started by two guys, Barry Smith and Bill Grop, in uh, 1991 when they both uh, were at Argonne. And it was to support their research. They were actually writing a book on iterative methods, and they couldn't get any current system to run their examples. So they built something to run all the examples for this book. And then um, Bill went off to work on MPI, and Barry rewrote it to be something that was suitable for other people to use. So a side-along question in there, then this actually predates MPI. So did you guys do parallelism with something else before, or I guess Barry and Bill, did they do something before MPI, uh, like PBM or something like that? Before MPI, there was PBM from Al Geist at Orno, but there was also P4 that Bill was writing. And so the original Petsy 1 um, used P4. And then when Petsy was completely rewritten and Petsy 2 um, they, he, they, they used MPI because, and that was, and they used the reference implementation that Bill and Rusty wrote during the MPI standards deliberation. Does Petsy only run in MPI, or can you run it just as a serial library, um, or like a shared memory parallel? Or does it only focus on distributed memory? So you can run it in serial. Uh, the usefulness of building it without an MPI is really just in breaking that dependency. Um, but it, all, of the, all of the examples run fine in serial, and Petsy uses sort of a mock implementation of MPI if you want to build it without an MPI library installed. Do a lot of users do that, or do most people run it on large distributed systems? Over half of the people that download it download it for Windows, and um, I have to imagine that a bunch of those people run it in this uh, without MPI mode because there's, in my opinion, still not a great install of MPI in Windows. You basically download this binary instead of being able to really build it. Okay. So the target audience then are just these PDEs, but some people can use ODEs. So what would be the benefit of using Petsy in a serial version versus using one of the you know alternate solvers that Petsy just uses? Have you cleaned up the interfaces or some other helper routines you have? So solving PDEs and in general large scale problems is a hard thing and it's really hard to know in advance what algorithm will work well for your particular problem. And as you add physics or you know, somehow change the problem, it can also change what kind of solvers work well. And so what Petsy provides is this uniform interface um, and a lot of tools that allow you to construct your own solvers that may be specially tuned towards the physics that you're working on. And so by getting these uh, third-party solvers through Petsy, it enables you to compose them uh, very elegantly and to swap out all of these components at runtime. I would just so add one small thing, and that is that uh, it also installs these things for you automatically. So it, re it relieves some of the burden of building these yourself. Yes, the build system for a lot of these tools is really, really bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the value, uh, what I'm hearing from you, is is not only the implementation of a lot of complex algorithms to do this stuff and, and to do it correctly, because correctness is, is a major portion of the battle, but also the integration of all these different algorithms, which may or may not be yours. They might be sort of the, the sub-packages. Is, is that a correct summary? Yes. Okay, so if I'm, a, I'm an application developer and I'm writing some scientific code or something and I have some PDEs or ODEs to solve or something like that, what kind of interface does Petsy give me and what, what languages can I use to you know, call the, the Petsy library functions? Well, okay, so two points. I mean, the languages, you can use, there's a wide variety. You can use C, C++, Fortran, 77 and 90, Python, MATLAB, but... Um, the issue of what's the interface, I think, first and foremost, Petsy is going to give you linear algebra. If you're willing to accept the linear algebraic interface, meaning matrices and vectors, then 
all the solvers just work with that linear and nonlinear solvers time stepping. And so if you buy into that interface up front, then uh, it's pretty easy to, to pull, pull together a, a code to solve most common problems. Okay. And in, uh, let me, I'm going to jump back a half a question here. In, in the implementation of these, I assume there's a, a level of effort put into the performance of these algorithms as well. Uh, uh, is performance a primary goal or is correctness more important than performance? How would you rate those two? So correctness is certainly the, the most important thing. We spend most of our time getting algorithms correct. Uh, but it, a, a lot of effort has gone into tuning the kernels that really matter. And so um, when writing these kind of codes, usually memory bandwidth is the main bottleneck and then also latency of the network. And so we go to great lengths to uh, design the algorithm and the data structures such that it's well suited to that kind of architecture. And then some of the low level tuning, such as in the uh, sparse matrix kernels, um, th there's been a, quite a lot of work there. Mm. So when you talk about these optimizations, you kind of touched on both. So you actually do design your algorithms with a distributed memory architecture in mind, but also paying attention to memory bandwidth and things like that. Um, do you also do things like assembly language to you know really squeeze out every flop possible for some of the the you know single machine kernels? Um, you know, in most things in Petsy, that's just not an issue, but. In the few places where it is, for instance, in block methods where you have small, dense um, operations, you know, we did, Chris did write some SSE2 specific instruction code to make that run faster on Intel, for instance. Yeah, and in some of my work, I have a particular, like, a dense tensor product thing, and I've uh, done a tuned, you know, S using SSE intrinsics in this case which I can get better performance than through C. But usually memory bandwidth is the limit, and then assembly doesn't buy you anything. Yeah. So when building PET-C, what do you guys rely on? I noticed like, a lot of these other sparse solvers and stuff, they all require a BLAST library. How, how important is using like better third-party libraries specific for your hardware or just relying on generic PETC, which which one's really important in getting good performance when using PETC? BLAS doesn't matter that much because most of what you're going to do in the sparse stuff is either BLAS1 or uh, it's some tune thing having to do with the particular matrix format that you have. So I say the BLAS library is not very important. Uh, I don't know. Jed, what do you think? Yeah, it's very rarely does it matter for this sort of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So are you looking at taking advantage of any, like, obscure hardware? Well, I wouldn't really call it obscure. It's really becoming more common. Um, accelerators, like, you know, OpenCL-based systems or FPGAs or GPUs or whatever you want to call them? Um, okay, well, I can, I can tell you, because uh, I work, I do a lot of GPU programming now, but uh, it's my belief that, you know, you put the right algorithm on the right hardware, and I think it's just quixotic to to think that you're going to get very much out of sparse MADFAC on these things. You'll get a speed up of, you know, five times maybe, and it'll be the same 5% of peak that you get on a regular processor. So I don't think it's all that exciting, but, of course, we'll, we'll do it. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I, I can associate with that uh, greatly because we get penalized for some of the same things in uh, MPI implementations. We don't necessarily want to do the optimization but uh, everybody's asking for it and it's the yeah so to provide a little bit of context here matt has been doing a lot of work on fast multipole methods which does map a lot more naturally onto gpu hardware hmm. yeah okay let me ask a, a real question Quick related question. You said that you know underneath the blahs doesn't really matter all that much for for many things. How much does the MPI implementation matter? Is latency and or bandwidth uh, important or or other MPI implementation issues? So uh, for for these sort of operations, there's two important uses of MPI, and so one is the 
the ghost or halo exchanges where you're doing nearest neighbor communication. And the other are the global reductions, uh, which you have to do when computing dot products and norms and such things within the algorithms. And at very large scale, probably those reductions are, uh, are the most important thing, in, at least in terms of strong scalability. Yeah, I'll point out, um, if you're talking about cluster size, so, so not something like Ranger, but something in, like the Argon Machine Jazz, that, that uh, it is uh, the uh, underlying switch fabric is, is really important. So um, Giggy just does not perform nearly as well as InfiniBand and very constantly complains about that. Now, when you say performance, are you talking in terms of latency or bandwidth or both? I'm talking about flops you can extract from a sparse matrix vector product because that's generally the dominant cost. And it, it really, um, uh, I don't know why, I, don't, I, would, I wouldn't say that I know exactly which piece of the MPI is doing it. Um, but I, sounds like bandwidth, right? But I don't know. Uh, for, the, for the MPI, I believe it's the reductions. It's, well, uh, it, it's, it's all uh, latency in that. Right. Well, for, for large enough, but um, it does matter whether you have Gigi or InfiniBand for these moderate sized clusters and you see huge performance differences, you know, 30% or something. So I don't want to get into that too far, but yeah. InfiniBand raises the price of most systems we buy by 30%. So it pretty much yeah, evens I out. Yeah, I hear you on that. But, it's it's uh, going to be application and uh, and um, site specific requirements, right? Where do you want to spend your money? Do you want to spend it in less time for your computation, or do you want to spend it in in longer time, you know, but more nodes or something like that? this? Is a classical cluster design issue, right? Totally. Yeah. And I mean, in my opinion too, I I think those performance gains probably are in part due to drivers. I mean, some of those drivers are just bad. And if the people who spend more time um, writing a nice driver, we get much, many fewer crashes with the mirror net stuff because they have a better driver. It's weird. Well, that's so, interesting. So uh, it does highlight the importance of, uh, you know, there's multiple levels of, of middleware involved here. And I, I certainly, this is, this is dangerous territory for me to talk about <laughs> the goodness or badness of open fabrics. Um, there's a lot of right. good points to it, but there's also a lot of good points to all the different types of networking out there. For example, a, a prior uh, RCE cast, we talked to Brice Coglan from Enria, who did mm -hmm. the OpenMX project. And so... They've done some very interesting stuff on, on significantly lowering the latency of, of Ethernet because they avoid the whole TCP stack, for right. example. And so that would, I would love to hear from you someday if uh, you know, that kind of stuff actually matters, if you could get better performance on your gig E just by you know, swapping out to use a different driver effectively. I bet that's true. So I want to back up a little bit. We talked about what bindings you can call Petsy from. What is Petsy itself actually written in? So Petsy's all written in C, uh, with the exception of a couple of pieces that are only enabled with C++. That's uh, some of Matt's recent work, for example. Uh, but it uses an object-oriented design, and so you can... Uh, well, use it from a variety of other languages, and you still have a, a real object model. And so you talked about everything being like plug-in. How hard would it be to basically add my own special solver into the PetC framework if I wanted to? Ah, so that is supposed to be the really easy thing. So if it's not easy, we are not doing our job right. Uh, that's what it's for. Okay, so how long does it take for, like, a new solver comes by, how long does it take you know, one of you guys to add that into Petsy? So it doesn't need to be distributed with Petsy in order for it to be a first class to whatever uh, you know, client code might want to use it. Um, so for example, one of our users or a vendor, say, can implement a matrix format and say a preconditioner that works with that matrix format they can compile that stuff into a shared library and send it off to somebody else. And they can load it without recompiling or relinking anything. 
you know, assuming you're on a system that has dynamic uh, loading, and it'll be first class. Uh, that is, as far as their code is concerned, it's the same as something that's distributed with Petsy. Uh, cool. So these are these are true plugins per se. Then you can just put a couple of new plugins in the right directory, and they get found and discovered and used at runtime. That kind of thing. Right. So they, they'll get they'll get loaded. Um, you know, by the the client program, just you know, picks up whatever's in a directory, say, and then they'll be able to use them and compose them with other uh, with the other pieces of their solvers. Um, just like a native one, so on the command line, for example. Mm -hmm. How many native solvers is Petsy distributed with currently? Oh, geez, well, I got to look at the web page here, but I can tell you in, in a, not too long. Um, it's, you know, there's probably, well, I shouldn't guess. I should just look. Uh, here we go. Summary table of all linear solvers. Oh, it looks like at least 30. If you there's a bit more than 30 preconditioners. Yeah, yeah, I guess if you count all of the... Well, yeah, and, and it's, it's all composable, right? So even if there are 30 or 40 individual things, you can, you know, split the matrix into blocks, use a separate one on each block, have a hierarchy, uh, like a multi-grid or a grid sequencing take high hierarchy and use different solvers on each level of the hierarchy. You can, uh, Jed put in cool sure complement stuff, so you can use a different thing on the sure complement part than the other part. And you can compose uh, them multiplicatively or additively, so you can kind of build uh, an infinite array of these things using an algebra of, um, of operator application. And most of this composition you can do at runtime uh, mm -hmm. through command line options or a config file. So even though it's a library, you can modify the behavior off the command line, not just using things like environment variables or other ways? I think, I think the, the primary way to modify the behavior is, is the command line. And I, I guess the, it, it really goes to the core of what the proper programming style is. I mean, for us, when we saw the linear system, we create a linear system solver, create a matrix, create a vector, and call solve. And your program is maybe 50 lines long. And then from the command line, what you could do possibly is you could tell it, well, I want a separate solver on each one of these blocks, or, or I'd like to divide this thing in two and do a sure complement algorithm. And I myself have had you know, 50 or 60 options on the command line to try out a, a very specific solver for that, whereas the code did not change at all. Let me ask you a, a question related to this. So we have a similar kind of functionality in, in OpenMPI uh, where you can specify all kinds of command line things and, and you know, change the network that you're on, change the, the uh, collective algorithm, stuff like that. We found that some people use that, uh, but the vast majority of our users really just do a, a plain vanilla run, and they don't try to, to tweak parameters on the command line or in environment variables or config files or something like that. It's really a smaller subset of, of power users that uh, actually go try and tweak things at runtime to extract all the best performance. H how many of your users actually do do command line or environment variable or whatever tweaking to, you know, suit their needs? So I think the majority of users do this a little bit, but I think a lot of users probably don't see the full power that, that you actually have there. But maybe in a different from your application, um, you can easily have an order of magnitude between different command line options um, because really uh, solvers are so problem dependent. Yeah, it could be the difference between you solving the problem and not solving the problem instead of the difference between it going fast or slow. Ah, okay. Um, so what's what's the ecosystem like around Petsy? I mean, you mentioned uh, you briefly mentioned vendors. You mentioned core stuff. You mentioned uh, the fact that you don't have to ship a, a solver in Petsy itself that somebody can write their own and and use it internally or ship it internally. How much of that do you actually have? You know, who contributes to Petsy and and what other Petsy entities are are out there? You want? No, we stumped the guest again. Well, okay, <laughs> I'll I'll tell you something. So. 
Uh, I think most everything um, is eventually done by us um, because um, if people like the Pastics guys um, wrote their own pets, the interface wrote their own. And part of the interface is writing your con part of your, the configure script that locates you and downloads you automatically and builds you and stuff. And they did all that and it was out there, but then they eventually contributed to us and we maintain it. And I think that's our model. Um, there are external things that take a while to get reintegrated. So um, companies that use Petsy, like Fluent, for instance, made a lot of changes, and it, you know, I, it, was, it took a while for all of them to get reintegrated, but eventually they do, I think. I mean, there's no way to know, right? Um, you know, when, when they tell us about this stuff, like when you know, one of the, some of the guys, I hope I can say these companies, but like... Um, one of the guys at Shell had just written amazing stuff, and we did, would have never known it was there if he didn't give it to us, right? But um, there is, there are a lot of external uh, contributors, but we are basically the maintainers. That makes sense. So it, a lot of stuff develops in the wild, but it really doesn't get uh, you know well known or well used until someone can just download your package and and just build it and install it, and it, now it's magically there. Mm. Yep. Okay, so what license do you distribute uh, Petsy under? So Petsy has its own license, but it's uh, it's similar to uh, two clause BSD, I guess. It's uh, it's very liberal. So uh, throwing a, a throwback way back earlier in the conversation, uh, Brock made a reference to the fact that you have your own build system, and uh, you said a little earlier too that the configure bits will go out and download uh, packages and this all talks speaks to the integration that you guys have done what uh since i'm the kind of the build guy in open mpi i have a uh, an inordinate interest in this kind of stuff did you guys use standard uh, gnu auto tools or did you do something else how did you do that stuff okay i'm really going to control myself here because we could do a whole program on just build systems <laughs> yes, i would love good. it but okay so let me try to be nice i spent a whole year writing a complete auto conf of petsy in that year, it became clear that autoconf is crap. So uh, we uh, we rewrote the whole thing in Python. So it has, you know, it gets rid of use of M4, which is not, in my opinion, a real programming language. And uh, it, you know, it's properly namespaced and all, and you can do dynamic uh, loading of modules. So you can just have configure modules sitting wherever, and they will get automatically loaded. And Nice uh, plugin architecture, and it does automatic download and build of the packages, which was over 50% of our Petsy main, if not more, was, um, hey, I can't build this package. And once we just automated it, um, we saw a huge reduction in work that we had to do with user support. Um, we're, we will eventually rewrite Make because uh, Make on uh, Windows sucks because you have to install Sigwin. Um, so that is the next thing up. So it sounds like you put in a, a lot of effort into the system, which is actually fairly unusual. Um, but I, I'm glad to hear it because we did we, we did things, and I agree with you on some of the shortcomings of the the auto tools. We still use the auto tools, but uh, one of the reasons being that uh, we it would be a Herculean effort to rewrite it. But we had to do quite a bit of. Uh, stuff for the discovery of plugins and stuff like that because that is really not in the GNU Auto Tools model mm -hmm. at all. And it was quite, quite difficult. Yeah, but uh, it, always nice to hear another complex build system out there for, for good reasons. Yeah, I mean, the Auto Tools, is, Auto Tools is built so that you can write LS. It's perfect for LS. But if you have any kind of dependency at all, it stinks. There's no composability at all. So I want to move to something else. The uh, Earlier you had mentioned a couple of users of Petsy. What are some of the uh, major users of Petsy that maybe some uh, users have heard about? So there's a lot of uh, libraries that use Petsy. Um, for example, uh, LibMesh and Deal2 are finite element libraries. Um, Slepsy is a uh, eigen solver. And then there's there's some commercial stuff, I guess Fluent, um, I think uh, Chombo mm -hmm. and Pflotran. Uh, there are um, like there are some other um, simulators like Magpar, which is Micromagnetics. 
and um, there are automation um, suites like Phoenix that have Petsy underneath for the solver part. Okay, and what's some of the uh, largest systems that you've actually heard of Petsy being used for? Um, I don't know how to really describe this in terms of a sparse matrix, but how would you describe a, a large system and what are some of the largest things you've ever seen done with Petsy? So I know there's been systems over a billion degrees of freedom and uh, there's been runs on at least 130,000 cores. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's as big, we can run as big as you want to get. So the, the Blue Gene P at Arganza, 130,000, we can run on the whole machine efficiently and uh, Rich Mills from PFlowTran has done billion plus uh, degree of freedom runs on Jaguar, the XT5 at Oak Ridge. So we haven't hit the limit of scaling yet. What's the uh, what's the strangest use of of PetC that you've seen? One of the fun things that we see as open source developers is that sometimes your software just gets used in completely unintentional ways that that you never imagined. What uh, have you heard about any of these for PetC? I, I think we both agreed we didn't really know how to answer this question. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, <why> don't we... <laughs> but, um, so something that's done somewhat commonly, but is definitely against the philosophy of Petsy, is that people take matrices assembled in serial from some like third-party source and then want to use that as a parallel solver. And that's a it's kind of an awkward thing to do to distribute these matrices, and it's, of course, not scalable at all because right. the assembly is, uh, is far too expensive. Okay. Um, so I'm looking on your webpage here, and it says that Petsy 3.0.0 was released a little over a year ago. What kind of things are you guys working on for the next release? What are some of the upcoming features that users can expect? You go ahead on this, uh, Jed, and talk about the, the new stuff in TS first. I think that's cool. Yeah, so I, I've been doing some work on the time integration uh, part of Petsy, which has been historically a little bit weak. Uh, so I put in a few different uh, solvers. So one of them is for explicit systems. Um, for example, uh, for hyperbolic problems where, uh, like Euler equations, somewhere, somewhere that you have shocks and you need to preserve some uh, monotonicity. And the other stuff, which is maybe more interesting to me, is for stiff systems and uh, systems where the semi-discrete form is a differential algebraic equation. Uh, so this is where you have some constraints. Uh, a lot of DAEs come out as like a limit of an infinitely stiff system. And so I put in some uh, general linear methods, which are new, like the, the paper presenting the method that I use is two years old. Um, and so that stuff is in TS, and I, I'd like to see more people use it. Uh, that, that's my latest stuff. So, you know, I'm very interested in these um, fast summation methods now, and uh, they're sort of cousins. Petsy supports the FFTW interface as a matrix operator, and um, this has analogs um, for <clears throat> that come more out of analysis than algebra, like fast multipole and wavelet operators and the fast Gauss transform. And I'm working with uh, some guys in Boston, uh, Lorena Barba, to um, put these into Petsy. We, right now, they're like kind of companion packages. They depend on Petsy, and you can do them. But we, we want to eventually reintegrate them as um, linear operators that sort of you can select in the same way you select FFTW, and that, that should happen in the upcoming year. And there is some support for unstructured grid manipulation and defining, uh, you know, fields over these, um, you know, complicated topological objects. And, you know, it's there, but it has very few users. So um, it's not as good as it could be. Uh, and so I would hope that we would make some progress in making that better over the, over the next year or two. Okay. And I, looking a little closer on your website, I see you have 300 patch 10 
Uh, mm -hmm. Assumedly, that was your your most recent release. When what kind of time frame are you looking at for our next release? Is this going to be three one or what? Are, what are you going to call it? How big are the changes? I guess. Hmm. Do you know that one? Uh, I I don't know I don't know what the timeline is, but I think it's uh, I think Barry's message as of a week ago or whatever was that we should do it soon. I think it was get that damn release out is what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We have yeah. we have a similar philosophy in Open MPI. We'll release when we're ready. Yes, yeah, yeah. we try, but <laughs> sometimes we skip. <laughs> um, so uh, along the same lines, and this is a slightly different question, um, you know, what kind of things, if you had infinite time and monkeys, what would you like to add to Petsy? You know, your kind of your favorite pet peeves or your favorite feature that you just never had time to actually do. So maybe the, the most interesting to me is this uh, it, it's sort of an exotic domain decomposition scheme for indefinite problems. Uh, so a, a lot of the um, linear systems that are very difficult to solve are what's called the indefinite. And they correspond to like finding a saddle point. And uh, a lot of the conventional preconditioners don't work very well for that. And so we have one tool right now, uh, which are called short complement methods. Um, but those have certain weaknesses. And anyway, I would... I would like to have this exotic system, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> I think Dimitri is working on it a little, but um, I think if you ask me, I am the thing that I find uh, fascinating and I believe underutilized at the current point is uh, boundary integral formulations. Um, most people by default go to a volumetric finite element method, and they work, and there's very they have very nice properties, but um, you know. There are a lot of sweet spots for boundary integrals, including you know moving domains and um, stuff like this, where it's really hard to manage a volumetric mesh. And I'm do I'm trying to you know get some of that kind of support. Um, you know, you could look at it as well. You, you know, you just end up with a matrix uh, vector problem anyway. So, in some sense, we support it. But there are a lot of tools that are specialized in these codes that um, you know make it hard for people to jump in. And we have those kind of uh, kind of support for finite elements. I'd like to put it in for boundary elements. Uh, one question I always like to ask other developers is, uh, what do you guys use for source control, and uh, why? Uh, oops. Okay. I guess I'll answer. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, so we, uh, we use Mercurial, um, and at some former time used uh, Bitkeeper, but Mercurial is very good. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of Mercurial myself. Okay, any particular reason that you guys use uh, Mercurial? Well, when we looked at everything, um, Bizarre was unfinished. Um, Darks was uh, very slow for large projects. Um, Mercurial was Python, and there really had not, Git was not, um, didn't have the momentum that it has now. Um, I, can, I can understand the arguments for Git, but again, we're, we do a lot of work in Python. We kind of are becoming a Python shop, and so that made a lot of sense for us. How big, you mentioned large projects, how big is Petsy? How many files, lines of code, whatever, whatever metric you want to use there? It's around 300,000 lines of code. Which is funny because it used to be around 500,000 lines of code. <laughs> and then uh, Barry, Barry demanded that we do a cleanup and we were able to shrink it uh, significantly um, because, you know, it's numeric code, you you tend to have boilerplate and you copy it over instead of really trying to reduce. Well, that's excellent that you were able to do a concerted cleanup effort like that and reduce the size of the package considerably. That's that's great. Yeah, we threw out a bunch of stuff. <laughs> so what is the uh, contact information for Petsy? Is there a mailing list, a website uh, where you can download it? Yeah, so there's a website. Um, if you just Google Petsy, P-E-T-S-C, or you can go to 
uh, mcs.anl.gov slash Petsy. Um, you can get all the information there. There's uh, two mailing lists, one for users, um, where we get a lot of uh, a lot of questions. You know, some of them algorithmic and interesting, and some of them just about you know how do, how do I get this installed to work here? Um, and then there's a development list where we you know discuss sort of new things or uh, that's going into Petsy. And then there's a yeah, address Petsy Mate um, that is where most of the sort of configuration problems uh, should be going. Mm. And if someone wanted to get involved working on Petsy, is the Devel list the best place to get started? I yeah. would say. <laughs> well, I would say pull the pull the Mercurial version because uh, I did this about a you know a couple of years ago when I you know, started uh, looking into it and you know look at how some of the source is structured and you can add plugins and discuss on the development list. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, guys. Well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think we're done here, and this show will be up this weekend. So, thank you very much. Great. Appreciate your time, guys. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Cool. See you later.